Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is um, Hunter Montgomery. I'm the CMO of Higher Logic, and welcome to the webinar featuring the key findings from the Leader Network's latest research study, The Business Impact of Online Communities. Vanessa DeMora is going to walk us through some of her key findings. She's also a little bit about um, you know, the surprises and things she learned after interviewing you know, over 200 different organizations worldwide who use online communities as an important part of their business. Um, so as I mentioned before, I work for Higher Logic. We are one of the co-sponsors of the event along with the conference board. And as an online community platform, we are very excited to be part of this research study and also been very intrigued by the key findings. But I'm going to let Vanessa go, go through that with you all. Um, as I mentioned, we're a co-sponsor. The other sponsor of the event is the conference board. And Alex Parkinson, who's their senior researcher and associate director, is going to give you a little bit more background on his organization. So go ahead, Alex. Thank you very much, and thank you for having us. Uh, we're delighted to be uh, co-sponsoring the research and, and this as well. Uh, I'll try to be brief. The, the Conference Board is a global business membership organization working in the public interest. Uh, our, our agenda is to help leaders navigate the biggest issues impacting business and to better serve society. Um, I'm, I'm wearing two hats, as it were, today, or two branded hats, uh, with the Conference Board and also the Society for New Communications Research of the Conference Board, now lovingly known as SNCCA. SNCR. Uh, the conference board merged with Snicker about exactly one year ago. Uh, Snicker is a 10-year-old research organization dedicated to the advanced study of the latest developments in new and emerging communications tools and technologies. Um, our, our fellows at Snicker include a leading group of futurist scholars, uh, business and communications leaders, members of the media and technologists from around the globe, and that includes Vanessa, who's going to speak to you shortly. Uh, I just want to say that we're really excited about this research because uh, the conference board generally has uh, started to, to look very closely at uh, understanding how digital technologies are changing business, transforming business, looking at digital transformation more broadly, and in particular how, uh, how uh, companies are demonstrating the value of these technologies and, and other social media to the C-suite. So thank you again for having us. I'll, uh, I'll hand over now to Vanessa DeMauro, the CEO of LeaderWorks, to give you the key findings. Thanks, Alex and Hunter. So before I take everyone through some of the key findings, I wanted to tell you about the context for this study. So a number of years ago, I used to run an executive level online community for a really large consulting firm. We had 15 staff and 1,000 members. It was a vibrant, active community, and we were a huge success by all accounts. We actually sold it for $7 million to EarthWeb um, after a couple of years of running it. And yet, I knew to avoid the firm's CFO. And that's because he gave me a nickname. And he used it in every conversation we had. He called me Cost Center. Good morning, Cost Center. How are you today? Hey, Cost Center, are you coming to the meeting this afternoon? And this is how it went for years. And that's because he viewed communities as a cost center, and it was a meaningful hit on the budget. Now, a lot has changed in our profession since then. Communities are growing up and becoming a really important part of the business, but yet we still have that Achilles heel. We often don't have the data and ability to report on the business impact, and that's until now. So that's why we did this study, in order to help you, the community leaders, Sort of look your CFO straight in the eye and have some answers to our burning questions about the business impact of online communities. So for the next 45 minutes or so, I look forward to telling you more about what we learned. So to give you a framework about this study, we examined five key themes focused on the business impact of online communities. There's listed there, competitive advantage, organizational impact, um, revenue, cost savings, obstacles, and success measures. The survey was completed by 271 participants, so it was a very sizable number, um, and they completed it very recently, November 7th through December 1st. And in terms of the demographics, um, this is kind of exciting, so you can find a bit of your organization or your community you know, in some of the participants. It was pretty evenly split between um, B2B and associations, and we had a nice smattering of B2C and B2C and some others. 
and we had very senior participants, um, senior managers, directors at large organizations, even CFOs, CEOs, and some executives, um, senior executives as well. And the split was pretty evenly divided between communities of all sizes. So whether you have a really small community or a powerhouse of, you know, a million members, uh, your, your segment data is represented here in this study. And in terms of community types and age, almost all of them have, most had a customer base and community, and many had an internet as well. And if, if you look to the right, you can see the ages of the communities varied. It was a good representation from very young um, to very old. And then the last thing I'd like to notice, and then we'll get on with it, is that we analyzed all the data by those segments down below. So what that means is while I'm presenting some of the data and you start thinking to yourself, well, how does B2B or B2C different, or is there a difference between new communities or old communities or big communities and small communities? We ran all of those slices against the data to look for any differences. And whenever there is a statistically significant difference in the data, we list it on the slide. If you don't see a comment um, about a difference, then it means that they were identical or within um, a, you know, a normal range of um, the sameness. So just look for those little call outs to see if there's anything unique about um, the segment analysis. So with the first key finding, a solid digital st strategy aligns with the business goals, and this can be a real game changer, changer. But what game are organizations trying to change? That was the question we asked first, when we said, what, digital competitive, what does digital competitive advantage mean to your company? And we learned that for the majority of marketing and communications leaders, competitive advantage means retaining customers. And here's the data around it. It's important to notice that we asked this question at large, not pertaining to the community, but in general, what does digital competitive advantage mean to your company? And that was, the reason for that was so that we could understand their starting point and baseline their organizational priorities. And as you can see, community retention topped the charts with 57%, followed by customer intimacy. So it was really reactive. Keeping cus company customers was more important than getting new ones in terms of competitive advantage. But despite this finding, um, when we get to the metrics section, we found that this is the area where there were the fewest metric examples in the retention area. It's pretty clear that we have work to do in connecting these dots between community and competitive advantage. Um, and the case can be made for many organizations that communities do retain customer and deepen intimacy, but we just need to get clearer on the methods for reporting it. Here we're looking at the impact communities have on the organization. So nearly 92% of marketing community leaders reported that their communities have an impact on the organization. That's fantastic news. And 25%, one in four, said it was a really large impact. Now, if you look to the key themes on the right, so, you know, obviously community leaders are going to say communities are important, um, at least to some degree, we should hope. But we then wanted to find out in what ways are they important and how are you seeking to leverage them in the future. And on the right, you'll notice some very sophisticated future plans that involve deeper integration for the community into core operations. And you'll see that the communities are being envisioned as part of the entire buyer journey and not just for engagement and support. And we believe this trend is going to continue in years to come. So to dig deeper, we looked at how organizations are using their employee and customer communities to make an impact in the next two slides. So this question pertained to the use of employee communities. When we asked about the primary use of internal communities, we found that most organizations, 68% or the majority, use employee communities to bring the teams together to collaborate more efficiently. And more than half use communities to find experts to better support customers and partners. Those were the top two areas on, in internal communities use. And we think it's interesting um, that the top two responses to this question 
are really pertaining um, to communities uh, having an impact on customer facing operations. So you bring teams together to collaborate faster, you know, to deliver something, or you find experts to support the customers and partners. So while they're internal communities, um, the work that's being done at the, on them is certainly customer facing. The next question is the counterpart to the internal communities. And in this question, we asked, how are customer-facing communities being used within the organization? And close to 7 in 10, 69% of the marketing and community leaders who participated said that they use their communities to listen to members' needs so that they can market better. It's the whole personalization thing. And they use the communities as well as research channels to identify customer champions and distract, detractors, surface trends for future development, and even spot and resolve products or service issues. So among all of that, the key word there is listening. And we know that listening is key to responsiveness, but it's really the tip of the impact iceberg. And we think that uh, Customer communities will become even more crucial as a source of new product and service ideas and as a channel for sales to engage with prospective, buy prospective buyers over time. So right now we're just doing a lot of listening and really trying to extract some of the key findings and insights shared in the communities. But in the future, once we refine those skills and opportunities, um, we're going to start digging more deeply into operations. Another big key finding that we're very excited about is that communities are producing revenue and in substantial amounts, but it does take time to get there. So this question set was about if communities are generating revenue, and if so, how much? Because that's really the question of the year. You know, what's coming out of the communities that um, will make the CFO sing with joy? And we found that 49% of communities, almost half, generate or influence revenue. And 29% realized more than a million dollars last year. That's really big news, but it is nuanced. So relatively few communities report that they can account for direct revenue accrual, such as e-commerce, which really is more common in consumer communities than B2B or association um, communities However, there's a strong showing of respondents who report that communities influence revenue via customer retention and satisfaction. And if you think about the first slide, that's how the majority of marketing and community leaders are defining competitive advantage. So that's really good news. And if you look to the right, these findings become even more interesting when we look at them over time. So we looked at, um, the data a different way, and we found that 55% of communities five years or older generate or influence more than a million dollars. On the flip side, 43% of communities, a pretty decent number who have existed for two years or less, generate or influence less than a million dollars. Now, we don't know why that is, because that wasn't part of the survey, but we believe that um, through the interviews and some other work that we've done, that um, that pertain to this study, that it's not that the young communities aren't generating revenue. They just haven't refined or gotten sophisticated in some of their reporting accountable, accountabilities and metrics to be able to find um, them with certainty. So granted, there are some young communities that aren't generating revenue, but there are probably a, a decent bucket within that um, slides on the, the data on the left that aren't reporting revenue because they don't have the tools or the ways uh, to account for it, where the older communities, they've gotten their facilitation intact, they really have their benchmarks and metrics, and their systems are running quite well. So now they turn to sort of some of the higher order um, accounting basis. That's our theory anyway. Now we're going to move to talk about reporting. And a key finding is that there's a burning need for better reporting of community expenditures and cost savings. Now, a primary goal of this survey is to explore in real numbers what it costs to have an online community. So we asked, what are the annual costs of your online community inclusive, including software, staff, 
and content. Now you can see we broke down the cost by sizes of community. So we've got small, medium, and large, and we created some buckets there. And naturally, the bigger ones tended to spend more. And it looks like the very small communities are not spending very much at all. Um, chances are they're using open source software or you know, whatever um, they can get their hands on because they're you know, just starting out and oftentimes those were the very small companies as well. But notably, 25% don't even know what they're spending in any capacity if you look to the far right. And that's a pretty big number. You know, communities um, are material and the fact that one in four have no idea what they're spending is sort of a red flag that maybe we need to dig a little bit more deeply and think about this pretty intensively. Now, if you look to the middle, we believe that organizations that spend less than 200,000 um, are either understaffing their communities, not investing in the software, or not accounting for internal chargebacks like IT labor. So oftentimes when you ask IT to fix something or you get some, you know, someone produces content for the communities, because of the lack of sophistication around some of the um, reporting and thinking about this in financial terms, we believe that um, there's a good chance that those um, spends aren't being attributed to. Um, or the communities are mainly relying on uh, member-generated content. But in the middle, there's the, really the healthy base, the 51,000 to 500,000 in the expenditure. And that seems to be um, you know, the centerpiece of the sort of healthy communities at large, those that spend and invest and track um, their savings accordingly. Now here's the flip side of the coin that pertains to cost reduction. Almost half, 45% of marketing community leaders say that their communities reduce costs for their organizations. And some of them are really reporting big cost savings too. You'll see here almost 15% said they saved more than a million dollars last year. That's not trivial even in a large organization. So this is really great news. You know, we've long believed that communities um, reduce costs, and here we have, you know, some of the proving grounds around it. But the not so great news in here is that almost 40% didn't know whether their community saves their organization money or not. And we believe a main reason for this is because leaders simply don't have a firm grasp on some of the methods, the KPIs and metrics to track this accurately. And later on, we'll show you um, a metric framework that will help you do that in the future. Okay, this slide pertains to savings versus costs. So we had a little fun with the data and we drilled into it to see if there was a connection between spending and savings. We wanted to see if communities that were properly funded with you know, enterprise ready software, staff and content support were more beneficial to the organization that communities that, than communities that were not supported or sort of cobbled together with gum and a shoestring. Um, and yes, it does look like funding a community correctly can have a bigger impact on the bottom line. So 56% of the communities that spent more than $200,000 annually saw cost savings of more than $100,000 um, a year. In contrast, only 15% of those that spent less than $200,000 reported a cost savings of $100,000 or more a year. So the key takeaway here is that, like with any line of business, miracles don't happen. Um, you've got to spend money to make money. So what does this mean to, you know, to us as community professionals? What are some of the key takeaways from this theme? So. Um, you know, it's important to really meet with your CFO and think about developing a cost-benefit analysis um, of your community. Where are you spending? Where are you saving? And really get your, uh, an understanding of um, what the landscape looks like so you can start to report accurately. And track what you spend. Get your financial and business metrics in a row so you can start to see what you spend against what you yield. And I think this is really one of the most important points is 
the need to align expenditures with community goals. I mean, when we work with clients, and in, you know, as we all know this story, well, they want all these things to happen. There's amazing pressure and expectations on this community, but they've given us three pennies and a can of Coke, right? Um, so once you can understand your cost, um, your expenditures and savings, then you can look at um, the goals that are expected of the community and make sure they're in alignment. You, you know, no one gets a miracle, you know, for, for nothing, right? You need to invest in the community in order to get um, reasonable outcomes. So now we're going to turn to look at ownership models. Another suite of questions was around, you know, what does the um, collaboration and ownership look like within organizations? And we found that marketing is the primary owner of the community for most organizations, 79%, although many other lines of business are involved in the community initiatives. And this status puts marketers in a highly visible and relevant role. Um, they're really conducting an orchestra of departments to create and sustain relations within the business's most critical assets, like customers, partners, and employees. It's very strategic to be at the helm of a community. But who's really involved in the community leadership in, in organizations? And we know, it, we know that it can vary widely, so we wanted to learn a little bit more about where some of the key ownership models are. Um, and what we learned was that communities are really silo breakers. And by this I mean, this is a place where many departments collaborate across the organizational boundaries, especially in the more mature and robust communities. It's not surprising that marketing leads the pack with the majority involvement there, but you'll notice that it's followed closely by, behind by operations and support, especially if the community is a support community, as a fair number of them are, and you know, that support executive needs to be involved, and um, corporate communications as well. So with community, uh, with marketers being at the helm, you know, this, they're really in a highly visible and relevant role. Um, but need to collaborate well all across the board. And we thought it was kind of interesting, too, that there's sales and R&D. Um, with R&D, we would imagine that those are the communities where some of the product and service suggestions and customer inputs or employee inputs are mined and used to fuel future innovations and development. And this other spike of 30% caught our eye. Now, we didn't ask who other was. Um, in the open-ended, but we believe other is probably IT, um, is another uh, key leader in the community. But marketing is the main owner of community. Marketing owns almost 40% of communities. Um, now that wasn't the case as you look to the right as much with um, associations as we know that member services and marketing um, are often in associations under the same umbrella with different titles. So the takeaway, what this means to you now, um, or what can you do with this information, is there's an opportunity to strengthen relationships with all lines of business. Get to know the different lines of business, strategic objectives, find their pain points, and figure out how communities can really solve their needs. And collaborate with support teams um, and, and community managers and content creators really to set clear priorities and understand how that the community can be aligned um, in support of the whole organization. And don't forget to thank the CIO and IT team and all those content contributors and um, volunteers on your community. You know, it really takes a lot of um, people, a village, as they say, um, to keep communities sound and vibrant. And um, because we know this is an all hands to the party kind of experience with community, you know, remember to, um, to acknowledge them. You know, you'll get, they'll be more excited, they'll be more likely to participate, and that keeps the engine running. And the final key theme here is really centered around measurement. And we found that business-focused metrics are really nation. They're really beginning. They're new. But a standard of measurement is starting to emerge. So 
now that we've done all this happy talk about cost savings and revenue generating um, and who owns the community, we also wanted to sort of take a somber look and look and find out what are some of the ways um, that uh, with some of the obstacles that get in the way of community success, you know, partially because we are curious, but also to help us all overcome them, right? Because we're all in the, uh, in, the, in the business of making sure our communities are, um, you know, world class. So we asked community leaders, what obstacles do you face in leveraging the community to achieve competitive advantage? And you'll see here and we're, that 72% face issues related to analyzing and reporting the data. Um, and an additional 22% um, lack reporting tools. So we've got data analysis um, not connected to community or to a customer relation, um, relationship management system. So we can get community data, but we don't know uh, who the members are in relation to the larger footprint. Because um, when you have a CRM integration, you can see the whole life cycle of that, um, that, that buyer or that customer journey and lacking meaningful metrics to report on business success. Um, so it's notable that 35% lack these meaningful metrics to report success in business term. And this is a theme that carried out throughout the study. And you know, we looked at some of them, you know, the different data inputs. So many times participants answered, I don't know, or I guess, in response to a lot of the financial questions. And it, it's important to notice that it, this gap in knowledge is not because we didn't draw from a senior level participate, population for the study. Very senior people participated, the people who know these answers for their other um, initiatives, but they, they have the capacity, they have the spreadsheets, and they have the know-how, but they don't have a firm handle on this information as it pertains to the community. But don't despair. One of the shining crowns of this research study is coming up next. And we gathered hundreds of metrics um, and also brought a number of ours from our work building communities. And we're really excited to show you this sort of golden egg um, that came out of the study. So this is the, the community impact framework. So backing up the bus to tell you how we got to this, um, you know, lovely picture is we asked an open-ended question um, in the study. We said, what are the top three to five success measures your community tracks? And we knew, we figured, uh, you know, we'll get some people to respond, who knows what we're gonna get, but we left it open-ended because we wanted to see all the different variations of metrics that came to mind. And we received more than 100 responses. So, you know, as, as researchers, um, you know, we both were glorious in our splendor and also, you know, <laughs> a little crazed coding 100, you know, 170 or, you know, giant number of paragraphs of um, KPIs and metrics. And we took these data and we organized them and we added, you know, many metrics of our own as well. Um, and we, we coded them um, and created a t this taxonomy because one of the challenges we all face is we have these, it's sort of like data, data everywhere, but not a drop to drink. How do we sense make out of these metrics and what do they, they mean and what sort of, what story can and do they tell? And that's the missing link. So we created this taxonomy and um, the answers ranged from vanity or baseline metrics such as number of members and numbers of posts to sophisticated business focused metrics that would delight you know, any CFO to our core. And armed with these examples of how communities um, track community, uh, how these community leaders track to impact, um, we also looked at creating you know, some of the reasons for uh, the meaning behind each of the, the categories. So if you look to the left, and I'm going to describe this, and then we're going to talk about this a little bit. It goes from tactical metrics, such as community vibrancy, straight down to business integration. So the first, first three are really about use and engagement around the community. So community vibrant metrics, that, that's like when you go to the doctors, you're, you know, general practitioner, and they make sure that, you know, all your systems are working. So these communities are really dedicated to tracking the overall health and, and utility of the community. So some example ones are uh, membership growth or newsletter opt-ins, um, you know, the, 
visits to the site, how long do people stay, that kind of thing. So is it alive? Is the community vibrant and healthy? Now the next set is engagement metrics. And these are technically a subset of the community vibrancy metrics. But because engagement is on everybody's mind these days in our industry, we created its own little subset. And these are CVM um, engagement metrics. So this tracks the community relevancy. So this looks at the level of engagement as a subset of vibrancy. So some example metrics that fall under engagement category are maybe the number of participating members or contributing members as measured against um, the larger number of met members. Is it 20%? Is it 10%? Um, how long does it take for a member question to receive an answer? How frequently do people post? Do people post once and never come back? That type of thing. So that talks about how engaged are the members with each other and with the community. The next one is um, CCIM, or content consumption and impact metrics. Now, as communities are evolving, we now know um, quite poignantly that Communities are very important for sharing information and for um, sharing points of view and thought leadership. And even in um, technical communities, for example, sharing new information about a new product or service that's being offered in associations, you know, advocacy and, and many happenings um, within that wheelhouse are very important. So we believe it's important that the visibility of the content is important in looking at the community impact at large. So how many people did the content reach? Did people engage with it? And we believe even event registration should fall in that bucket because that's a form of content even if it's verbal or in person. And communities, as we know, are very important in fueling um, event participation on or offline. The support metrics are pretty straightforward, as many communities um, pertain, you know, are dedicated to support, and this tracks the value of community as a support channel. Uh, so time to resolution, ticket deflection, um, speed, things like that. And chances are, if you have a support community that's fairly sophisticated, that this is the area where we got the most sophisticated and um, deep metrics um, out of the, the pile that people submitted. Now I want to talk about community retention and satisfaction metrics. This one is really fascinating, okay? I want to clarify. When we say community retention and satisfaction metrics, while it's important to retain a happy community member, that's not the emphasis on this. If we think about the purpose of this study and the purpose of communities at large is really to um, impact community uh, competitive advantage, customer retention and success metrics are really dedicated to connecting the role of community in the larger customer retention and satisfaction wheelhouse. Now backing up the bus to the very first slide and data point, we found that customer satisfaction retention is of utmost importance to the company's competitive advantage. That's the number one thing they care about. So if we can get more clear around establishing how communities advance customer retention and satisfaction, you know, the world is going to be a better place and our executives are going to be a lot happier. So if you look to some of the example metrics, um, it's not just NPS scores uh, who are community members, although that's a popular one in our industry, but things like customer churn reduction. We know at large in general that customers who participate in a community tend to be retained or buy more within the organization um, than customers who don't have community participation. So it's, we can make that connection, but you need to use your community metrics to track that. Or we also know that customers who rely on community for support and engagement and new product information are more likely, especially in cloud-based offerings services, to retain and renew their subscriptions. So that's an important theme there. The marketing and sales metrics are pretty straightforward, and there's a nice bucket there. And then the business impact metrics, the BIM, 
business um, integration metrics. This, this one we think is most important and most difficult um, to codify, not because it, you can't trace it, but because there's no, you're going to have to do some manual um, analysis in order to come up with these metrics. So you might want not want to do these or commit to them on a monthly basis because that's just painful, but on a quarterly or biannually, um, that would be really important. And this tracks the impact of the community on core operations. So for example, if you can say um, in your community, these are the 47, 12, or 200 new ideas that were generated by customers that we were able to package up and give to R&D or product development, for example, um, or member services. And then of these, this is how many were, were implemented. That is an enormous connection or pro speed to market. We know that communities can accelerate a, a speed to market. We know that when a, when a company launches a new product and services, if it's well um, discussed and explored and supported in the community, there's going to be a meaningful uptick or more customers will um, adopt it in a more rapid time frame. So making that connection shows you know, the business value. And for the intranets, we didn't forget about you. Um, some of the ways that you can connect operational um, impact is by looking at efficiency. How, few, you know, how more quickly did we generate documents or collaborate? Or how many meeting times did we reduce? You can back into the cost savings um, if you know, you're able to eliminate three meetings of 15 people every couple of weeks because you can collaborate on the intranet. So there are ways to do it with both intranets and extranets. So that's, you know, we're really excited about this. Um, and let me just um, tell you a little bit about how we think you can use it. So up until this community impact framework, um, you know, each one of us running our beautiful, you know, gorgeous communities in house are making up our own metrics dance, right? Um, I've been in your shoes. When I'm with one company, there's this set of metrics, and then I move to another organization to run a community, and there's a whole new set, and I can't even have a conversation with another community leader because we're talking two different conversations, two different sets of um, language and vocabulary. It's like the Tower of Babel. But just like every other industry, um, they have standards of measure. You know, there's gap analysis, generally accepted accounting principles, marketing, we all have the same metrics. And it's time for community to start to think about um, reporting and tracking things in a consistent way so we can compare apples to apples and really um, be connected here. Okay, I'm a little stuck here. Just give me one second. Oh, there we go. So the takeaway here, um, at the end of the day, the take home message is um, the opportunity to measure what matters, um, really focus on the strategic goals, and make sure that you're focusing and adhering on them. And think about your community as a living focus group. It's a primary source of, of early stage, low cost research that can inform customer service, marketing strategy, and R&D. Leverage what you learn and help others, teach others in the organization how to do that. And you know, we hope we, you use this community impact framework to tell your you know, community business impact story reliably, consistently, and um, with, with authority, because you know, we have that opportunity now. So the bottom line is that the future is bright for community um, as long as we take the time to take stock of our operations and really treat it like a line of business, um, at least in how we report and discuss it. You know, communities are important to the business, but it's really up to us to prove how and in what ways they're meaningful to executives. So we're having a big impact on business. We're throwing confetti around the room. We can establish that. And um, we need to just get better at how we measure and communicate business impact. It'll free up funding and it'll um, get us more of the support that we need and, and deserve. So that's our story. Um, you know, a little bit, I realized I didn't even tell you anything about my firm. Um, we do research and consulting, leader networks, uh, with a focus and specialty around online communities. And we think a lot about the business strategy and operations of community. Um, 
And we've got a ton of great resources on our site. We've got a brand new website, but we put up more um, past studies and other community resources like this. So please visit us, check it out, and we're really proud of it. So that's who we are. Um, so I think now might be a good time to open the floor for questions, and um, I'd love everyone's feedback on this study. We're really excited about it. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Vanessa. So we did get a number of questions uh, that came in throughout the presentation. So I'm just going to read a couple and um, see what you think. So the first one is, what advice do you have for making the case to leadership that community does create competitive advantage? And it, that the expenditure is commensurate with expectations and impact? Well, I think, you know, that's sort of a theme of this presentation. If you're able to begin, you know, find one or two of the business metrics that are meaningful to your leaders or to the business, you know, no, you will have insight or can find out what some of the strategic goals for the organization are start there and then you can backward engineer how the community is and hopefully it is in support of that goal so for example if your organization's objective is to reach a new audience or to advance um, a new product or service you start there and then you can look at your community and determine a couple of key indicators that help connect the strategic goal of the organization, which already exists, with how community helps support it. Great. So here's one that's a little bit more practical, and I hope you have some information on this. Are there any companies that said there was a financial loss in using a community? If so, what were the pain points, and how does one avoid these things to be sure that there is a profit? Does that make okay. sense? It does. Um, when we ask the questions um, pertaining to the revenue spread, you know, there were some that um, we had the buckets. To, uh, let me actually go to that slide instead of trying to describe it. So there were two answers to that question. The first answer is um, loss and gain were part of the question set. So the less than ten thousand. Um, oh. Let me see, that's the wrong one. We had less than 10,000 as um, a gain, so it can go from negative to less than 10,000. Um, we did not drill into the specific levers of, um, oh, I went past it. Well, anyway, we did segment analysis, um, but did not, to see if there were any differences between those and uh, some of the others in terms of the challenges they faced, but there were no differences or else it would have been called out on the slide. Okay. Um, this is sort of a continuation of the theme. So what methodologies have been used to monetize the community? And an extension of that, how do you measure how our community external facing generates goodwill? Okay, so there are two questions here. There's methods to monetize, and the other question pertained to the sub-question, measure goodwill. Yeah. Okay. So there are, there are many methods to monetize. You know, in the absence of any information about your community, um, it's hard to have a concrete answer on how your community could advance the monetization goal, but I can give you some general examples of how we've seen communities be successful with monetization, but these are, you know, sort of generic without any specifics. So there are a variety of ways in which communities um, can create revenue, and a lot of times it's when it's not a direct sales channel like with some of the B2C, it's through adjacent, um, adjacent models, affiliation models. So one great example, oh, let me give you some examples, that'll work. With the Palladium Group community, which is an, um, an online community of strategy executives, it's a small community. Um, it's in, you know, it was maybe four or 5,000, but very, very senior people. That community, they were one of my clients, 
we broke even in six months and then created revenue there forward. And we had what's called a bifurcated revenue model, which means we had multiple revenue streams. So the community was open to all members, but we took some of the most coveted assets, strategy maps and um, thought leadership articles and, and training, and we put those behind a gate. So any member could join, but there was a fee for um, premium services. But we knew that we were only probably going to convert about 20% of all of the members to the premium service. And that's okay because, you know, it's a community is for everybody. And we had some really fantastic stuff that was free for all. So the other ways that we generated revenue in that community was we partnered with um, a number of senior executives who um, did recruiting for the type of persona or population that was part of our community. We didn't let them into the community because we didn't want them trolling our members, but when they had a particularly difficult um, role to fill, we, would, we knew our members intimately, so we would mine um, who among those members might make good candidates. We would have an early stage vetting conversation, and if they said yes, then we would introduce them to the recruiter and we took points um, that means money, a certain percentage, um, of the placement fees. So we had a pretty vibrant revenue stream that way. We partnered with um, HBR and um, two other organizations and, and, um, as early stage sponsors, um, but not sponsors in terms of they put their ads all over the community, but they were able to see the community in certain areas with labeled sponsored content, but with thought leadership articles and things of value. And then another way that we generated revenue, I'll just give you one more example because I could go on and on for like five hours on this topic, um, is that we found, um, we found organizations that had adjacent products and services that were interesting to our members, but not part of the Palladium group you know, a service offering. And we, ha we charged for them to do thought leadership webinars and have visibility in the community long as what they, um, what they had to share was a thought leadership value and pertaining to a topic that was critical to our members. Um, so it was a win-win for everybody. And I can go on. There are many, many other, um, we did bu group buying um, pass-throughs and things like that. But there are many ways that you can go about it. Uh, but be creative and think, what does your member want that you can bring to them and um, so it's a value to everybody and you can charge for that. Now, the other side of the question pertains to how do you measure goodwill? And that's not dissimilar um, from some of the metrics that were generated around customer um, retention and intimacy. And I'm getting over to the metric slide again here. So, you can, so under customer retention and satisfaction metrics, instead of looking at things like renewal rates, if you're trying to look at goodwill um, or you know, positive sentiments, you can measure that by perhaps doing a sentiment analysis, and there are tools to do this, and it's often built into platforms, but there are external tools that will codify um, all the positive comments. Um, another way that you can create um, some metrics around that is how many uh, customers or members of your community were willing, um, were approached and willing to serve as an ambassador or speak on behalf of the organization. Um, if you can say, well, we approached five people and four said yes, and we were able to produce three testimonials out of it, and the cost savings of, of that and the speed then, uh, of, of getting to there was you know, certainly reduced as opposed to looking at a database of 1,000 members and going, who should we ask? Um, you can start to make the business case that way. But look for meaningful outcomes and trace it back. All right, great. So one last question, and we're going to go back to the uh, community impact framework, which I think is a, a highlight of this study. Uh, so the question is, how do you suggest I put the impact framework into practice? What should be my first step or two? Okay. Oh, that's a great question. Um, well, they're all great questions. I've spoken like a teacher here. And I always start with your organizational goals. Okay. So if, if you know, if you if you can identify the organizational strategic goals, there are three things you know, that are on our strategic agenda for this year. Or you can start with a 
a line of business schools. Marketing has this point of pain, or um, product development has this point of pain, or member, um, member services has this point of pain, and then figure out how community can support it. That's your starting point, and from there you can identify specific metrics um, that, that help you make that case. So the goal of this impact metrics framework, nobody wants to see um, in your organization, in, uh, you know, 47,000 metrics, this is really presented here as a shopping cart or a, a, a sort of a buffet of metrics for you to choose from. And I would start with most communities will need to report, you know, a select number of the community vibrancy metrics, because that just says, okay, we're here, we're alive, we're doing well. And then based on the strategic agenda of your community, you can cherry pick maybe one or two other categories and start and find a couple of metrics um, that pertain to that category, but have an array. And I would really recommend not tracking on a regular basis more than, um, you know, three to five metrics on a regular um, on a regular basis, because otherwise all you do is spend your time reporting and you water down the impact of the ones that really matter. So pick your st strategic goal or your line of business goal, find some metrics from this array of categories, um, develop you know, best practices on how to measure them, and then um, repeat, rinse and repeat and show progress over time. And it, it, the only other thing I would add is you know, in, a, in about um, um, two months time, maybe less, we're hoping for less, we're coming out with a KPI framework that, that documents how to, um, how to calculate the different metrics across all of these different spectrums. Um, we just had to get through this study first, but we're going to have the how-to manual um, out in short order. All right. Great. Thank you, Nessa. Well, um, again, thank you to Leader Network and Vanessa for the study and everybody for joining us today. We will be sending out a link to the recording of the webinar uh, probably within the next, or definitely within the next week. And I'll also have a link to the full report if you'd like to download that. And again, thanks to everybody for joining us and have a great rest of the day.